low-income households. And um, my grandparents were truck drivers and farmers. It wasn't a necessity for my parents to get a college education. But it was my parents' dream to give me and my two sisters, Vanessa and Tricia, a possibility to have a college education. Now, lucky enough for me, my parents were willing and able to help me pay for college. And all three of, all two of my siblings and I had the chance to get an athletic scholarship. Hmm. This is not the average college story, though. Most college students will be forced to take out student loans and pay for their college education. This is one of the largest issues facing Americans on a day-to-day -day basis. Unfortunately, college students must worry about paying off loans for years to come after the college, edu college experience ends. You should not be crippled by college debt. College should be tough and come at some cost, but not a cost that can damage you for years to come. This is just one reason why we have a presidential candidate on campus today that I can support. The issues of student loan debt is just one issue Senator Sanders is fighting to change. Today is the day to start the change of the price of college tuition, to stop it from financially crippling a generation. When my parents uh, were my age, college was not seen as a necessity. But for today's generation, it is the next necessary step but is unobtainable for most students, for some students because of the cost. I know Senator Sanders has shown that he is willing to fight for my generation and generations uh, after me for college tuition and other issues. Whereas some politicians may have forgotten that we are the future of America. Senator Bernie Sanders has worked to uplift the voices of young students and people just like me. I believe that Senator Sanders will continue to fight for my generation and fight for more accessible college tuition. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Jamie Nelson to the stand. Good afternoon, Oskaloosa. My name is Jamie Nelson. Ten years ago, I walked across the stage at the William Penn Activity Center to receive my Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education. I got my first teaching job right here in Mahaska County, and for the past ten years, I have dedicated my life to the field of education. As you all know, Iowa's education system is facing a lot of challenges as funding for our schools continues to be cut. It's forced us to make some very tough decisions about how we keep our doors open and how we serve our children. I teach second grade. Every single day is an adventure. I've laughed and cried and enjoyed every second with them. Every year though, it seems our budget is a little less and we all volunteer to do a little more to make sure our students never suffer. We come in early, we stay late, and we take more home. I've braided the hair of my students whose parents had to get up to leave early for work. I've wiped away the tears of my students who have woken up to a tough situation at home. I brought in my own children's outgrown coats and shoes to make sure someone had what they needed. Every now and then, I give my students a word problem to solve, and I'd like to give you all a word problem right now. Why, in the richest country on earth, are we struggling to fund the most basic level of education? Why do I, as a public education teacher, have to purchase snacks for my students who are hungry? The answer? Our economy, our system of government, is rigged for the wealthy and powerful. I'm ready for a better world for my daughters, for my students, and for our future. The best solution to the problems we face is electing Senator Bernie Sanders as our president in 2020. Bernie believes in fully funding public education programs and expanding child care that would provide an opportunity for all children to enter high quality early learning programs. He believes in improving our mental health care system so our children who need services are not put on waiting lists. He believes in raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour so our paraeducators can make a living wage. Bernie believes in providing access to free community college for all of our graduates. 
These ideas are not radical. They are revolutionary. This election is not about me. It is not about Bernie. It's about all of us. And together, we can make this revolution happen. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to Senator Nina Turner. Wow. It is so wonderful to join you this afternoon. And I definitely want to give a shout out to Anthony and Jamie for sharing their stories. Our stories are our strength. It's good to be here. And the issues that they both talked about, whether they're talking about college debt or, as Jamie talked about as a teacher, having to pay for supplies, those stories amplify the struggle that many face in this country, not just in this community, but all across this country. It is also a painful illustration that we have so much more work to do to level the playing field for all folks in this country. Not only is our health our wealth, but when we think about education as one of the greatest equalizers that we have, we know that as a nation, we must do better, we can do better, and we will do better. And that's why Senator Bernie Sanders will be the next president of these United States of America. Go into my purse and get my notes. You know, I had a Southern grandma, and, and my grandma always kept her money in the Southern Ladies Bank and Trust. Oh my God, let me just say, as we have been touring Iowa, and Iowa, you are absolutely fantastic. You were right there with Senator Sanders in 2016, and I believe and I know in my heart you're going to be right with him in 2020 because he is the kind of leader. You know, you don't have to wonder where he stands. You know where he stands. And he has been, in the words of my brother, Dr. Cornell West, a long-distance runner for justice. He is a visionary in every sense of the word. And oftentimes, visionaries are not understood because they're so far ahead of everybody else. But Senator Sanders has been committed to the causes of justice all of his life. And all we have to do is check the record, check the receipts. You know, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., if I might, Oscar Luther, on a Sunday, Quote a reverend, the true measure of a man, and I want to add the ladies into that, but the true measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort or convenience, it's where they stand when the roads are rough. Now I'm paraphrasing Reverend King, but that really is the measure of people who are willing to stand up, to speak up, to use what they have to make a difference where they are, and that has been Senator Sanders all of his life. And he doesn't wait for polls to tell him that the morally right, just, and good thing to do is to stand up for Medicare for all in this country so that folks are not locked out. He, He was preaching that sermon when it wasn't popular. And look what he was able to do in 2016, sisters and brothers. Even though he did not win that race, he won something that was much more deep. He won over the hearts and the minds of the people of this country who said, we deserve better and we are going to get it. And fast forward to 2020 
that most of the Democrats running for president have adopted his policies, his value propositions. That is because he has been a long distance runner for justice. He sets the pace. He doesn't follow the pace, he sets the pace. So I wanna, man, I'm really feeling this thing. You know, my mother was a preacher and I, I had to go to, to church, my siblings and I, eight days a week, so I'm feeling something on a Sunday. But there's something in the Christian tradition. I know that people come from many walks of life, but if you just allow me to be who I am just for a minute, there's a scripture in the Christian Bible that I think aptly describes Senator Sanders. And it says that you will know the tree by the fruit that it bears. And he has been bearing the fruit of humanity. It takes a certain kind of leader to stand up and tell us that the system is rigged, that it needs to be changed, and these are the ways that it can be changed. He doesn't just point out what the problems are, he has solutions. It takes a certain type of leader to stand up to say that they do not just want to be president of the United States of America just to live in the best public housing. <laughs> You'll hear the senator talk about that. Or he just doesn't want to be president just to get the most fancy title. That he wants to be president of the United States of America to leverage the power of that office to be the change, to make the change, to uplift the everyday woman and man in this country from all walks of life. That he wants to be president of the United States of America for transcendence. It takes a certain type of leader to say, not me, but us. And that has been the senator's mantra all along because he knows that the type of changes that he is trying to bring to bear, that he will not be able to do it without you. And you, and you, and you, and all of us collectively, the rainbow mosaic of humanity, standing up in concert with one another to say that we deserve better. And sisters and brothers, we don't begrudge anybody wealth. Wealth is a beautiful thing. Listen, I was born poor. I probably got some folks in here who can relate, but I'm not trying to die that way. <laughs> so now, unless we change the system, that oppresses a system that says that the more wealth that you have or the more connections that you have, it makes you a better person. Therefore, you deserve better. We reject that proposition. What we are sick and tired of is people making wealth on the necks and the backs of the working people of this country. That is what we will no longer stand for. And that is. That is what the senator is fighting for. And he understands from a lived experience, which he talks about a little more, of being a first generation college graduate, a lived experience of, as he describes, his family understanding what it means to be working class and not necessarily worrying about where the next meal was going to come from, but that the tension that not having a lot of money or enough money puts on a family. It is hard being poor. It is stressful when you have to try to figure out how to make ends meet. And as the senator constantly reminds us, nobody who works 40 hours a week, nobody who works two and three jobs to make ends meet should be poor, should have to struggle. We are going to change the system that benefits the 1% to a system that benefits the 99%. The measure of a man. The measure of a man. So I, 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 as I close this thing out, I'm, I'm feeling real good. Dag, they didn't give me my cordless mic today, but that's okay. <laughs> I just want you to wrap your mind around two people that I've been channeling since I've been in Iowa. One is Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, and the other is President Teddy Roosevelt. And Congresswoman Barbara Jordan said these words. She said, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. 
to have clean air, clean water, clean food, an America as good as his promise, to not be overtaken by corporate greed is creating America as good as his promise. For our family farmers not to be pushed to the side and to be victims of a system that gives the manufacturers and the corporate type farms or far biz companies more than it gives the family farm. It's creating America as good as it's promise. Making sure that young people are not saddled with debt. It's creating America as good as it's promise. Making sure that ladies get their whole damn dollar. It's creating an America as good as it's promise. Changing a criminal justice system that is unjust is creating America as good as it's promise. Rooting out institutional racism wherever it rears its ugly head is creating an America as good as it's promise. And knowing that we are all in this together is creating an America as good as it's promise. And the last person that I've been channeling is President Teddy Roosevelt, and he said these words. This country will not be a good place for any of us to live in unless it is a good place for all of us to live in. That is, that is the mission of Senator Bernie Sanders, a visionary. And I tell you this, sisters and brothers, you can take this all the way to the bank or take it home, take it wherever you want. One thing you do know that you have in Senator Sanders is that somebody that will not relent and somebody who can't be bought off by special interests. When he is elected the next president of the United States of America, he will stand up for you at all times. You can take that with you. We got the receipts. So I need you to do something for me as we prepare to have the senator come into this room is that if you have, if you, if you will join me and participate in this way, because I'm, I'm just feeling this thing, that our mission is so high we can't get over it. The mission for change is so low we can't get under it. The mission for change is so wide we can't get around it. We cannot do any of these great things without you. That is why he always says, it is not about me, it is about us. It is about all of us. Our strength is us. So if you will do this with a sister this, more, this afternoon, if you raise one hand for yourself as a symbol that you are in this fight and another hand for somebody else, with these hands, we will have Medicare for all. With these hands, we will have college for all. With these hands, we will transform this system into a system that answers to the 99 and not the 1%. With these hands, we will have transcendence. And with these hands, sisters and brothers, we will elect Senator Bernie Sanders as the next president of the United States of America. I love you, Oskaluska. Thank you, Oskaloosa. Whoa. <laughs> this is a great turnout, and I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, being here this morning. Uh, I want to thank Anthony Bodily for his remarks. And I want to thank Jamie Nelson uh, for her remarks. And I want to thank Senator Nina Turner not just for her remarks, but I want you all to know that over the last several years, uh, Nina has been doing, I think, some of the most important work that can be done in our country. She's been running all over this country trying to revitalize American democracy, trying to get working people and young people involved in the political process. And there's nothing more important than that, so thank you very much, Senator Turner. Uh, before I get into my, my remarks, uh, I wanted to make a request of President Trump. Now, this is a serious one. 
And that is, as some of you may know, uh, on Thursday, just a few days ago, the House of Representatives passed a very serious resolution, an important resolution, that we had passed uh, in the Senate a few weeks before that, a resolution that I introduced in the Senate. And what that resolution was about was getting U.S. troops out of the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Yeah. Now, a lot of people have not heard about what's going on in Yemen, but I just want to take a moment to tell you. Right now in Yemen, we are facing the worst humanitarian crisis on the entire planet. As a result of the Saudi-led intervention four years ago into a civil war in Yemen, some 85,000 children have already died of starvation. There is a massive cholera epidemic, and the experts tell us that if we don't get our act together, that country could face the worst famine that we have seen in a very long time uh, on this planet. So it's important for that reason that we end the war in Yemen, but there is another reason that's very important, and that is what the resolutions passed in the Senate and the House did is for the first time in 45 years, we utilize the War Powers Act to end a war that was unauthorized, unconstitutional, that was started by a president. And what that means, all of you know that the Constitution is very clear. It is not a president who has the responsibility to determine whether we go to war. It is the United States Congress. But for a very long time, under Democratic presidents and Republican presidents, Congress has abdicated that responsibility. This resolution begins the process of reclaiming what the Congress should never have given up in the first place. That's a big deal. Now, the president has said appropriately enough that he does not like never-ending wars. I do not like never-ending wars. So I urge the president, do not veto this resolution. Sign this resolution. Let's get our troops out of Yemen instead of bombs Let's provide humanitarian aid. And let me say um, another thing about the president. The president won here in Iowa in 2016. That's a fact. And I think the reason he did so well here in Iowa and the reason he did so well in many, many other states is that there are a lot of folks out there who are hurting. These are people who are working 50, 60 hours a week. These are people who are worried to death about the future for their kids. These are farmers who are facing really, really hard times in Vermont, in Iowa, all over this country. Family farmers are being driven off of the land because of incredibly low prices that don't cover the cost of production. And you got a lot of people out there who are saying, who is paying attention to me? I can't afford health care. I can't afford to send my kid to college. Can't afford rent. Can't afford to pay my mortgage. Anybody listening to me? And they turn on the TV, and they don't hear a lot about their lives on the news. Turn on C-SPAN, they don't hear a lot about their lives being debated in Congress. And Trump came along. Trump made some really good speeches, had some really good ads. And he said, oh, I hear you. I hear you. You can't afford health care. I, Donald Trump, if I'm elected president, I am going to bring health care to everybody. That's what he said. He said there are some Republicans, they want to cut Medicare and they want to cut Medicaid. They want to cut Social Security. Not me. I am not going to do that. He said, we are going to have a tax bill that's not going to benefit the wealthy, but our tax reform is going to benefit the middle class and working families. Well, you know what? 
All of that sounds pretty good. And I can understand why people in Iowa, many other states voted for him. That's a good line, good speech. The only problem is he was not telling the truth. And I think, I think since that point, since the campaign, we now understand, and, and regardless of your point of view, whether you're conservative, progressive, or whatever, I think we all understand that we have a pathological liar in the White House. Somebody who will say, somebody who will say anything to anybody at any time for any reason. Need I remind you that just the other day, President came up with a remarkable scientific conclusion <laughs> in determining that wind turbines, of which you have more than a few here in Iowa, cause cancer. Well, fortunately, he is the only person in the world who believes that, but <laughs> be that as it may. But on the other issues, and, and this is important, and, and, I, and I say this respectfully to the people in Iowa who voted for Donald Trump. He told you he was going to provide health care to everybody. Yet he strongly supported legislation that would throw over 30 million Americans off of the health care they currently have. Now, we have a health care system, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, which is already dysfunctional, already inadequate. What do you do when you throw somebody off the health care they have? What happens? if they're struggling with cancer or heart disease. What happens to their lives? Simply throw them off because you don't like Barack Obama and you want to end the Affordable Care Act? Donald Trump said, I'm not going to cut Medicare or Medicaid. I want you all to know that in the budget that he just presented to the Congress, his cuts to Medicaid were one and a half trillion dollars over 10 years. And Medicaid is not just a health care program for poor people. Medicaid covers a very significant portion of nursing home care. So if you've got a mom who is in a nursing home now dealing with Alzheimer's, understand that those cuts would be devastating. And you're going to have to think twice about whether you can afford to keep your mom in a nursing home. And Trump said he's not going to cut Medicare, well, his budget called for over $800 billion cuts to Medicare. And Trump said his tax proposals, tax reform, going to help everybody. It's not for the rich. Turns out that 83% of the benefits of his proposal over a 10-year period went to the top 1%. So I understand that people in their frustration, in their pain, voted for Donald Trump. I would just ask people to check the record and see if he did what he said he would do. And I think the conclusion is he betrayed the working families of this country in terms of what he told them. Our campaign and the government we intend to establish is has a very different vision than that of President Trump. President Trump is doing something which no president in our lifetime has ever done. And that is he is trying to divide our people up based on the color of our skin, based on where we were born, based on our sexual orientation, based on our religion, even based on our gender. He thinks he can get votes by doing that. That's what demagogues do. Our campaign and our government are based on very different principles. Instead of dividing the American people up, we're going to bring our people together. Black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American, gay or straight, native born or immigrant. We bring our people together around an agenda that works for all of us and not just the 1%.
and the principles of our government is a time-honored principle. And it has to do with justice, justice. We believe in economic justice. We believe in social justice. We believe in racial justice. And we believe in environmental justice. Yeah. And let me tell you about the lack of justice that currently exists in this country. It is not just when the three wealthiest families in America own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the American people. That's not justice. It is not justice when the top 1% own more wealth than the bottom 92% of the American people. It is not justice when 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. So our job is to create a nation, a government, and an economy that works for all of us, not just wealthy campaign contributors. At a time when the very, very rich are becoming much richer, over half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. Do you know what that means, living paycheck to paycheck? What it means is if your car breaks down, you know, people say you have money. Oh, your car breaks down. Let's take it to the, you know, we'll take it to the repair shop, get it fixed. Cost a few thousand dollars. What's the problem? Well, most people don't have that few thousand dollars. Their car breaks down. They can't get to work. They can't get to work. They get fired. They get fired. They can't take care of their kids. Paycheck to paycheck means that you stay up nights worrying that your kid does not get sick because you cannot afford to take your kid to the doctor. And you worry, God forbid, somebody in your family ends up in the hospital that your family is going to go bankrupt because you cannot afford the bill that you are going to get. That's what paycheck to paycheck means. And that is why throughout our country, so many of our people are living with stress. Now, I know about paycheck to paycheck because that's the family that I grew up in. And I know what it did to my family and I know what it is doing to families all over this country. But it's not just economic injustice that we have got to address. We have got to recognize that in America today, we have a corrupt political system which benefits the wealthy and the powerful. Now, maybe I am an old-fashioned conservative guy, not really. <laughs> but I kind of believe that democracy means one person, one vote. That's what it means. It means you get a vote, and you get a vote, and you get a vote. You agree with me? Good. You vote for me. You disagree. You vote against me. It's called democracy. We respect each other. We have a vigorous debate. That's the beauty of what this country is supposed to be about. Democracy does not mean billionaires spending hundreds of millions of dollars on elections to elect candidates who represent the wealthy and the powerful. That is not democracy. That is called oligarchy. And that is why we are going to overturn this disastrous Citizens United decision. Tonight, it's not tonight, it's today. Look a little dark out there, but it is still today. I want to say a, a special thanks uh, to the people of Iowa. Uh, because this is where, in 2016, the political revolution first began. So thank you very much, Iowa. What do I, what do I mean by that? 
What I mean is that when I first came here to Iowa in 2015, uh, not a whole lot of people knew who I was, and the polls had me at 3 or 4 percent. Uh, further, and, and more importantly, the ideas that we were talking about when we were campaigning throughout the state of Iowa, what the political establishment and what the media establishment were saying is, those ideas are extreme, they're wild, they're crazy. Nobody in America will support these ideas. You know, Bernie's a nice guy, but you know, nobody believes in what he is saying. We talked about raising the minimum wage to a living wage. Oh, and our critics said, Bernie, you're talking about doubling the federal minimum wage. I said, no. I mean, that's, come on, give me a break here. That's crazy. Can't be done. We talked, you ready for another radical idea that we talked about? We talked about guaranteeing health care to all people as a right, not a privilege. And we were told that's not, an, that's not an idea for the United States that may work in the UK, maybe in Canada, but certainly the American people don't believe in health care for all. We talked about spending a trillion dollars to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, our roads and our bridges. And you got some problems with bridges here in Iowa. <coughs> I thought Vermont was in bad shape, but I'm told it's even worse here in Iowa. So we have to put people to work rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure because a trillion dollars, that's much too much money. We talked four years ago about opposing Republican efforts to cut Social Security, but we also said we have got to expand Social Security benefits. Because people cannot make it on twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year social security. And we were told those ideas were too radical. And here's something I was in a debate, televised debate, and somebody said, uh, Senator Sanders, what do you consider to be the major national security crisis? And people thought that I'd talk about ISIS or Al Qaeda, and those are very serious threats. And I said, to my mind, the most serious threat is climate change. And people, literally people laughed when I said that. We talked about reforming our broken criminal justice system and our broken immigration systems. Hey, Bernie, too radical an idea. Now listen to this one. We talked about not taking money from super PACs funded by billionaires. Oh, my God. I want you to think about that one for a moment. Because historically, that's what politics has been about. Candidates run for office, they don't do meetings like this. They go to wealthy people's homes, they walk out with tens of thousands of dollars, they hire a consultant, the consultant puts 30 second TV ads, negative ugly ads on television, and that's called politics. And we suggested maybe there might be a different way to do politics. Maybe instead of going to billionaires, to get your money, maybe you go to ordinary Americans and maybe you can end up with 27 bucks a person. But that was, that was also considered to be a radical idea because it's a real departure from the way we funded campaigns for a very, very long time in this uh, country. And then we said, well, maybe, just maybe, there might be something wrong uh, with the power that superdelegates have over the political process. Maybe there is something wrong with the system when in 2016, Secretary Clinton had 500 delegates lined up behind her before the first ballot was cast here in Iowa. Well, the ideas that I talked about four years ago at that time seemed to be really crazy and wild and radical ideas. 
Well, a funny thing happened in Iowa over that year. And that is that on caucus night, we didn't win 3 or 4% of the vote, which is where we started. We ended up with 50% of the vote. And almost half of the pledge delegates. Now, why was that important? It was important because what Iowa did set the stage for the rest of the campaign. And that meant that we ended up winning 22 states around the country. We ended up getting more than 13 million votes, more than 1,700 delegates to the Democratic National Convention. And most importantly, for the future of this country, we ended up winning more votes from young people, black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American, than Clinton and Trump combined. And by the way, as I think all of you know, those ideas that we talked about four years ago that seem so very radical, well, they are ideas that are now supported by a majority of the American people and they are ideas that Democratic candidates from school board to presidential candidates are now supporting. So that is, I think, the debt of gratitude that the people of America owe to Iowans. What you said is that common sense ideas that work for working people are not radical, they are not extreme, they are what the United States of America needs. Thank you very much, Iowa. I want to just touch on very briefly some of the issues uh, that we'll be campaigning on and some of the issues that we will be implementing uh, when we get to the White House. And I use the word we, and it's not the royal we, you know, that sometimes is used. Why do I use the word we? Why is kind of the mantra, mantra of our campaign, it's called not me, us. Why is that? And it makes for a nice bumper sticker, <laughs> which we may end up making into a bumper sticker, but it's not really, it's not really what the bumper sticker is. Why do I say, I'm going to ask you guys a question on that one. Why is it more than a slogan? Why is it absolutely imperative that we talk about us, not me? Who has a thought on that? Yes, ma'am. Did everyone hear what the woman said? Can you stand up, ma'am? Possible? Okay, thank you. Now that's exactly right. So let me tell you something that I'm quite confident no other candidate for president will tell you. And that is that no president, no matter how honest or well-intentioned he or she may be, and by the way, I know many of the Democratic candidates who are running, and many of them, I know them, they're in the Senate, these are good people, honest people. They're my friends, and you're not gonna hear me disparaging them today or at any time in the future. We're going to have a debate over ideas, not personal attacks. <laughs> but what the woman said is right for this reason, and very few people will talk about this. The truth is that if you look at the power structure of America, and you're not going to see this on television, it's not talked about. The power structure of America is that you have incredibly large and powerful financial institutions that not only control our economy, but control our political life as well. I'm talking about Wall Street, in which six financial institutions, six, have assets equivalent to 54% of the GDP of this country. Six, that means they control the flow of trillions of dollars. I'm talking about an insurance industry and a pharmaceutical industry that have unlimited amounts of money. 
I'm talking about a military industrial complex. I'm talking about a fossil fuel industry. We are talking about institutions that have unlimited sums of money and incredible power. And no president, no matter how honest or well-intentioned he or she may be, can go into the White House and alone take those people on and create the kind of policies that we need for the working families of this country. So my request of you is please work with me to win the Democratic nomination. Please work with me to defeat Donald Trump. But, but I'm going to be back to you the day after the inauguration. Because the only way we transform this country, the only way we make health care a right, the only way we create a livable minimum wage, we build the housing that we need, that we protect family farmers, et cetera, et cetera. The only way that I know it is when all of us together stand in the fight for justice for all. It's got to be us, not me alone. So I want to take a, a moment uh, just to talk about some of the issues that must be addressed and some of the policies that have to be implemented. Healthcare. All of you know that the United States of America is the only major country on earth not to guarantee healthcare to all people as a right. We're going to end that. Healthcare is a human right, not a privilege. It is absurd that we got 30 million people uninsured and even more underinsured with high deductibles and high copayments. Question, how many of you are dealing with high deductibles and high copayments? And that means if you have a high deductible, even if you have insurance, you don't go to the doctor when you should go. And there are people who died because they don't go to the doctor when they should. Meanwhile, and we don't talk about this enough, we are now spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other nation. So you could say, okay, hey, our health care system is not very good, but we don't spend a lot of money. Wrong. We're spending $11,000 a person, $28,000 for a family of four, and that number is going up. It is unsustainable. So let me make a very radical statement now. You ready for a really radical statement? All right. The function of healthcare is not to make insurance companies and drug companies rich. The function of healthcare is to guarantee healthcare to every man, woman, and child in this country and to do it in a cost effective way, which is why we will implement a Medicare for all single payer system. And that is why we are going to tell the pharmaceutical industry they're not going to continue to rip off the American people and charge us by far the highest prices in the world for the medicine we need. Healthcare is a huge issue, but it's by no means the only issue. As I mentioned earlier, all over this country, here in Iowa, in Vermont, all over America, you got people working two or three jobs just to pay the bills. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. People working 50, 60, 70 hours a week that don't have time to spend with their kids. And that is why we are going to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, $15 an hour. Now let me tell you something, you make 15 bucks an hour, you are not on the gravy train. You ain't getting rich, but at least you might have a little bit of dignity. Maybe you don't have to work 60 or 70 hours a week. Now when I was in Iowa four years ago and I was talking about that, people said, Bernie, you're crazy. You're gonna double the federal minimum wage, crazy, crazy. Well, since then, six states in America, and I hope my state will be the seventh, they're dealing with it right now, six states in America have passed legislation to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. 
And by the way, the U.S. House of Representatives a few weeks ago reported out of their relevant committee legislation, which I believe will pass the House, raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. And I got a favor to ask all of you. When that bill passes the House, and I think it will, and it'll come to the Senate, we're going to need some Republican votes. Please tell Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst that people in Iowa, because I have talked to people in Iowa, you cannot make it on eight or nine bucks an hour. You got to raise that minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. Please ask them to support that legislation. This country will not be the great country that we want it to be unless we have the best educated workforce in the world. And the truth is, 30 years ago, we did. That is no longer the case. Because what's happened over the years is while income for working families has remained stagnant, the cost of college has soared. I happen to believe that 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when we talked about public education, it was fine to say that we're going to provide free public education up to the 12th grade. That was fine. The world has changed in 60 years. Technology and the economy have changed. People today need more education if they're going to make it to the middle class than was the case 50 or 60 years ago. It is not a radical idea, and we will implement it together to make public colleges and universities tuition free. A story. Uh, on Thursday, I was in my office in Washington, and about a dozen young people came into the office. And uh, they are in graduate school, and they are in education. I think most of them are now working in schools, often very challenging schools, doing great work. And God knows we need great teachers in our schools, and they're doing the work. And one young man says, well, you know, Bernie, I'm in graduate school now, and by the time I get out of here, I'm going to be $180,000 in debt. You go around, you talk to people. How many of our people have debts of 50000 100? I talked to a young woman in Des Moines a few years ago, and she said she graduated dental school, and we need a lot of dentists, $400,000 in debt. So we have got to do two things. First, we have got to recognize that we want our people to get the best education they can, not only for themselves to get decent jobs, but for the country. We're in a competitive global economy. And second of all, it is really wrong and crazy to be saddling these young people who did the right thing. They went out and got an education with endless debt. If you're $180,000 in debt and you were a teacher, are you ever going to pay off that debt? You know, so what kind of craziness is this? So we're going to do two things. We are going to make public colleges and universities tuition free, and we're going to substantially lower student debt in this country. <laughs> Now, my opponents will tell you, well, you know, Bernie is a nice guy and has all these great ideas, spending money over here and spending money over there. Where are you going to get the money? Good question, fair question. Anybody here know how much Amazon, one of the largest corporations in America, paid in taxes last year? Zero. They paid zero. It's owned by the wealthiest guy in America. They paid zero. It's not just Amazon. It was true for Netflix, true for many, many other companies. Corporations and billionaires are stashing literally trillions of dollars of wealth in tax havens in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, all over the world, not just in America, people all over the world, billionaires stashing their money away so that they're not taxed. Well, you know what? I think it's time to end austerity for working families and maybe bring a little bit of austerity to the 1% under our administration, they will begin to start paying their fair share of taxes. <laughs> a 
Every day, President Trump says something a little bit more absurd than what he said the day before. <laughs> Hard to keep up with him. But one of his views, which is not just absurd, but incredibly dangerous, is his belief that climate change is a hoax. Well, Mr. President, climate change is not a hoax. Climate change is literally an existential threat to the well-being of this country and the entire planet. Some of you may have heard of reports that came out from the leading scientists in this world who told us that we have 12 years to transform our energy system and cut carbon emissions or else there will be irreparable damage done to this planet. 12 years is a very short period of time. What we have got to do, and I speak as someone who has four kids and seven grandchildren, we have the moral obligation to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy so that we can leave the next generations a planet that is healthy and habitable. That is not a debatable issue. That is something we must do. And today, we say to the prison industrial complex that we will not accept the United States having more people in jail than any other country on Earth, that we will not continue to spend $80 billion every year at the state, federal, and local levels locking up fellow Americans. We are going to invest in our young people in jobs and education, not more jails, more incarceration. And by that, I mean we are going to end private prisons and detention centers in this country. And we are going to end the so-called war on drugs. Makes no sense to me that we have seen many, many hundreds of thousands, and I expect millions of people, over a period of years, develop criminal records because they were caught with marijuana, making it harder for them to go out and get a job because they got that criminal record, while at the same time, the crooks on Wall Street who destroyed this economy, not one major CEO there went to jail, and in fact, they got a trillion dollar bailout. That's not... That is not justice, and that's not the criminal justice system that we are going to continue. And when we talk about justice, we are going to address the fact that we have 10 million undocumented people in this country. Our job is to move toward comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. So, let me conclude by saying this, and we'll open it up for questions and comments. These are unprecedented times in this country, and it is not clear what our future will be, and that's what this election is about. Will we move in the direction of oligarchy, where a handful of billionaires continue to control our economic and political life, or do we move toward a strong democracy, both politically and economically, where we see the middle class grow and not shrink, where we see more and more people participating in the political process. I believe from the bottom of my heart that all of the ideas, and some that I didn't talk about this afternoon, all of these ideas, these are not radical ideas. Almost without exception, these are ideas supported by a strong majority of the American people. We have got to end a system 
by which Congress continues to represent the wealthy and powerful because of all these campaign contributions. And we've got to move to a situation where Washington starts listening to the needs and the pain of ordinary Americans. So that's what this campaign is about. It's bringing our people together. It's standing up and fighting against very powerful special interests. And it is creating a nation that all of us will be proud of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I went on for too long, as I have a want to do. And let's open it up to questions or comments. Yes, sir. Stand up, so we've got a mic coming here. Evan, you got a mic? The uh, president says that the press is the enemy of the people. And I just talked to a press man today that just got kicked out of Thailand because he was reporting the news. Yes. How do you feel about that? I'll tell you how I feel about it. It's disgusting and it's disgraceful and it's dangerous. All right, and this is what you cannot, look, I'm a politician and I have disagreements with the media every day about how they cover these things. But to suggest that a free press is the enemy of the people it's unbelievable, and it is disgraceful, and it is dangerous, because your point is, is quite right. All over this world right now, there are reporters who are being killed or jailed for trying to expose fraud and trying to tell the truth, educate people about what's going on in their countries. Now, why does Trump do that? Why does he call the news fake news? He does it because what he wants to do is to make people think that anything that's reported about him is a lie, okay? And that is what demagogues have historically done. So I think that is not only a disgusting thing to do, it is obviously in a democracy very, very dangerous. If you disagree with somebody, and I do it all the time, tell them why you disagree with them, say they're wrong. But to call the press enemies of the people of fake news is disgraceful and very, very dangerous for a free society. Okay, questions or comments? Yes, sir. If you were to project the borders of, sorry, if you were to have as much as 147 million people to enter the United States if uh, you were to have open borders in our society today. Um, how would you deal with the social services connected with uh, opening the borders, such as health care, med medical care, and... Who uh, do you think is suggesting opening the borders? Well, um, that you're an activist for opening, for... No, I'm not. For Sorry. Uh, no. I'm afraid you may be getting your information wrong. That is not my view. Okay, I apologize. Thank you. Okay. I think what we need is comprehensive immigration reform. That is not simply... You're, you're quite right. If, you, if your point is you open the borders, my God, you know, there's a lot of poverty in this world, and you're going to have people from all over the world. And I, I, I don't think that's something that we can do at this point. Can't do it. So that is not my position, okay? Okay, uh, gentleman right there, sir. Uh, let me get your mic here. Yes. Uh, as a, someone that's not really uh, decided yet, because there's so many candidates to the Democrat field, you talk about uniting the people. Are you going to have to unite the people who are running for president as Democrats to, to, to stand together? Yes. Okay. Excellent question. And, and I think, you know, I obviously can't talk for other people, but I know many of the candidates. And I think, and as I said, many of them are my personal friends. Um, and I think I can speak for them in saying that uh, clearly I want to win and they want to win. But at the end of the day, I unless I'm very, very mistaken, we are all going to come together to make sure that Donald Trump is not reelected. That's for sure. Okay, uh, Evan, you got some hands? Uh, all right, well, there's a woman right here. Evan, right here. 
<clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Milena and I come from Serbia, so I'm not from here, but I'm very happy uh, to, to be here and to listen to this. It's amazing. Uh, and um, we heard from some Republicans uh, also in this state, and uh, it seems that where they uh, mostly disagree with your uh, viewpoints is that they say that there is no one to actually pay for some of these ideas. And there is a big fear that many of these big companies, if um, you raise uh, the minimum wage, that they're going to start letting people off and they're going to just start replacing all the jobs that they can with computers, etc. So how do you address this? Thank well, you. Well, good question. Uh, look. Republicans have been opposed to programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid from way back when. And they always tell you that if we do these things, they're going to be uh, impossible to implement and impossible to pay for. But many of, when you hear those Republicans tell you that, why don't you ask them if they're so worried about the financial well-being of this country, why they think it was a good idea to give a trillion and a half dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% and large private corporations. Why do they think it is a good idea to have some of the wealthiest people and largest corporations pay virtually no taxes at all in the United States of America? Our health care proposal will lower the cost of health care for the overwhelming majority of the American people. Hard not to do that when we're spending twice as much per capita on health care as any other nation. Truth is, we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Problem is, we have grotesquely unfair levels of income and wealth distribution. Now, the Republicans don't like to hear this, but I think that it is wrong, it is bad economics, it is immoral when you got three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of America, and we are going to address that. They don't like it, but what has happened in this country over the last 40 years is there has been a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the 1%. We're going to reverse that trend. Okay. Okay. Gentleman right here, and then we'll get to you. My name is Dwayne McClure, and thank you for coming to small town. My name is Dwayne McClure, and thanks for coming to small town Iowa. Thank My you. simple question is, is, Bernie, we see you on TV, and we see the president making his ridiculous statements. My question to all of you is, what goes on behind closed doors? Uh, when we've seen the uh, Supreme Court justice kind of ramrodded through and Grassley put that through, and then, and then when Obama had the Supreme Court justice, that wasn't even heard of. What goes on behind closed doors? Because all we see here is what we see on TV. Thank you. Well, I think um, what really goes on behind closed doors, and I'm not behind those particular doors, <laughs> is if and I mean this quite seriously, I want you to think about this for a second, above and beyond even justices for the Supreme Court. Why would somebody go out and talk to conservatives and talk to Republicans here in Iowa and say, hey guys, you're a conservative Republic, well, I got that. Do you think it is a good idea to give massive tax breaks to billionaires and then cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Okay. Do you think it is a good idea to cut nutrition programs and education. Do you think it is a good idea not to recognize the reality of climate change? And I suspect that a majority of Republicans say, no, that's not a good idea. Then how does it happen? How does it happen that you got a president who wants to throw 30 million people off of health care and give tax breaks to billionaires and Republican leaders want to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? Who makes those decisions? And then you find out where the money comes from. Anybody here ever hear of the Koch brothers? All right. Koch brothers are one of the wealthiest families in America. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars on elections. That is their agenda. So what it comes down to is that many Republicans, and Democrats too to some case, I don't want to you know, whitewash the Democrats here, they're also culpable. But people look at campaign contributors and they say, what is the agenda of the campaign, of these wealthy campaign contributors? What do they want? They want tax breaks. They want deregulation, and they want cuts to social programs. That's what goes on behind closed doors. Now, in terms of Supreme Court justices, Mitch McConnell was very, very clear. Who sits on the Supreme Court is enormously important, and what he did is keep uh, a Obama nominee uh, from getting that position, and that was just 
to my mind, uh, an absolute outrageous, outrageous action, and, and a you know, denial of what the Constitution says. The Constitution says the President has the right to make that appointment, Senate can approve it or not, but not to bring up that vote on the floor uh, was to me absolutely uh, uh, unconscionable. Okay, um, yeah, woman over there. I'll, I'll get to you in a minute. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanders, how will you uh, prevent that uh, if wages will be increased, it will not bring an increase in prices and services everywhere? Right now, what the evidence suggests is that if you increase the minimum wage, you improve the economy. You know why? Because if you're working for $9 an hour, you don't have any money to spend on anything. If you're working for $15 an hour, you may have a few dollars in your pocket to go out and buy your kids some gifts, buy your kids, take your family out to a restaurant, and buy some of the necessities of life that you cannot do. So I think raising the minimum wage to a living wage is a good economic stimulus. That's why six states have already done it, and we're going to see more and more states doing it. It is indefensible that the minimum wage has not kept up with inflation. And I have talked to too many people, including people in Iowa. Talked a while back to a woman here making $8.50 an hour trying to raise a child. You cannot do that. So the minimum wage in terms of purchasing power has declined precipitously over the years. It is now time to raise that minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. Okay. Okay, we've got a gentleman right here. Yeah, okay. Uh, our generation, I hate to say that, had something called the GI Bill. Was my generation, Vietnam, a lot of uh, bad side effects. Is there anything that you can think that we can do? Because that kept people like me out of debt and most of my generation. The GI Bill, all familiar what the GI Bill was? GI Bill was one of the, I think, most important and effective pieces of legislation ever passed by the United States Congress. So this is what it did. And this is what a Congress should be doing. Before the war, World War II, this country was in a massive depression. The war came, and your generation, the great heroes of our time, millions of Americans went to war, taking on Hitler, taking on Japan. God knows how many of them never came home, how many were wounded. But in the early 1940s, before the war was over, what the Congress said is, look, we got millions of these people who risked their lives, who gave everything, and they're coming home. We don't want to see them out on the street unemployed. So we are going to make sure that regardless of their income, they are going to be able to get a higher education free of charge. And the result of that is, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were able to go to college. They went to graduate school. They became doctors and lawyers and business people. And by the way, that is one of the reasons why after World War II, we had an enormous economic boom, all right? In other words, it's a perfect example of what happens when you give people the opportunity to get an education who otherwise would not have had it. It's not only thanking them for the incredible service they gave to our country, but it was good for our economy and the right thing to do. And it's exactly what I'm talking about today, all right? I'm talking about young people. I mean, how many great teachers and doctors and nurses are not going to have that opportunity because they cannot afford to go to college or they choose not to leave school $100,000? How crazy is that? So the GI Bill is an example of sensible public policy which works so well uh, for this country. All right, maybe one more question. All right, young lady right here. Yeah, here's a comment. Um, I was, my name is Kathy Pegel. I'm, uh, I live between Oskaloosa and Lacey. Um, I've been watching the news, and I didn't vote for this man. I didn't. He's gotten me so angry. And I'm thinking, where's this world going to? It's all going to hell if we all don't stand up and do something about it. It's getting worse. It's right there in the, pl in. it's as plain 
as the sun is shining outside. If we don't do something, there may not be an America left. Thank you. Well, I think maybe we end on, on that note, and, and that is kind of how I began. Is the rich get richer, and the middle class declines, and we've got 40 million people living in poverty. Only major country not to guarantee health care to all. Millions of young people are struggling with student debt. We've got more people in jail than any other country. We've got a $21 trillion national debt. We've got an infrastructure which is declining. We have more income and wealth inequality in this country than any time since the 1920s. Your point is well taken. I think it is time for the American people to say enough is enough and that we're going to create a government and an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. Thank you all very much.